Culture Colloquium. He's one of our first and first generation of speakers there. He's been doing. I, I was actually trying to reread his bio and come up to speed, and it was just. It was. It was. Just, it, I realized it was going to be impossible to do justice. But he's a. He's a musician. He's a writer. He's done science fiction. He's been involved in uh, uh, organizations in, in all across the world in the. Um, in, in South, uh, near the uh, Oceania uh, Islands, and he's been in Iceland, and he's worked with um, a huge number of, uh, of musicians from around the world, including uh, Yoko Ono and uh, uh, Metallica, no? Metallica? Okay. Right. <laughs> Name a band and he'll say yeah. Uh, and he's done uh, a huge amount of, uh, of new media art. Um, and so we have, and he's, he's also very involved in activism and uh, addressing a lot of current issues in, in terms of the environment. And so when he, I, I found out he was coming, which was very short notice, we're just uh, we're so we're happy that uh, uh, we we got him here. He is uh, he, he I said what you know what, what would you like to talk about? And he sent me this great list. It was like this menu, and he said, well, any of these things, what, what looks interesting? So I picked a few items. And then he like put together a cooked up a special meal for just for us. So we'll see what happens. But um, you guys are mixed. What? Yeah, it's like a mixtape. Yeah, no, and that's the other thing. He's, he's a consummate uh, uh, DJ on top of everything. Um, and uh, so he is, he's he's a fascinating um, individual and thinker. And so please join me in welcoming Paul Miller, DJ. Speed. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here at Berkeley, and first and foremost, I want to thank Ken and Greg uh, of PMIR uh, for inviting. And I've known Ken for, I think, probably, I don't know, 20, 20 something years? Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a long legacy of what I call the, sort of the, the way the arts has changed in the last 15 to 20 years, mainly from the viewpoint of how um, what I view as the, the more ubiquitous aspects of digital media have come home to roost at every level. So can I ask you guys a quick question? How many of you have a cell phone, just out of curiosity? Probably everyone. OK, so that's 100%. And of that, how many of you have an iOS device? Just curious. Uh, Android? Yeah. OK, so, and nobody has a BlackBerry. All right. All right. <laughs> so in that context, I have one person has a BlackBerry. No BlackBerry. <laughs> so in that context, what we just did was establish the idea of an ecosystem. And very quickly, we were able to see those networks that many people use to uh, kind of enhance how they think about mobile computing. And your cell phone, of course, um, as a product of a tremendous amount of innovation that has occurred in a very, very radically accelerated kind of context. So behind me, you have, um, this is a project. I'm just going to open up really quickly. Um, and by the way, I have what I call a very nonlinear approach. And this is very much on purpose. So there's a very famous phrase from the German poet Schiller. And I love actually Schelling. There's, there's a whole bunch of poets who golf talked about this idea of architecture and structure. So I'm going to talk about that from the viewpoint of information architecture. Um, and that term was coined in conjunction with a couple really interesting artists. But from the viewpoint of today's discussion, I'm just going to riff on it for a quick moment because I know time is tight here. But there's a very famous phrase where I say, architecture is music in space, as it were, a frozen music. So let's, let's unpack that for a moment. And now think about information architecture. Um, if we're thinking about design, if we're thinking about the very fact that we're all in this room with wireless networks and we're above all, everyone has a cell phone in their pocket, then basically that cell phone is the equivalent of an artist studio. It's your new palette, it's a way of giving you a sense of how you can make whatever creative act you want, your cell phone, uh, painting, sculpture, you name it, uh, 3D printing, to send the file, receive the file, and so on. But going back to this idea of frozen music, you know, there's this idea that dematerialization is very much part of the new vocabulary of our time. So when I say dematerialization, an artist for many centuries would have been someone who would have engaged not only with making you know, paintings and sculptures and so on, but would have had to get their work out through very specific networks of patronage. Um, you know, so say for example, if you're Picasso or Monet or Manet or whatever, there's a very specific idea of scarcity of work. There's only a certain amount of those paintings, and that generates a very specific, what you call perceptual value. Uh, so Picasso's worth a certain amount of money, but the market for that is based on perception. Jeff Koons, you know, Warhol, you name it. It's still this idea that there's a social network in place, and that social network is a kind of information architecture. So to me, at least, the structures at play here are mostly about the invisible and the dematerialized. So I'm going to start my talk with that. 
But I want to go to a book that I just did with MIT. It's my most recent book, and it's called The Imaginary App. And the reason I'm beginning my discussion with this idea of, of architecture and design, and above all, the power of the invisible, is that the book um, basically was done as a kind of a mixtape. And I wanted to get a group of theoreticians and writers and artists and people to think about the role of apps in design and how those apps have changed the creative process. So I worked with Stephen Wolfram, um, who is a very renowned mathematician. He's usually one of the world's lead, considered one of the world's leading mathematicians. And me and him used a, a conversation, which to me is like again a very specifically like dialectical idea here. You have different points of interest and convergence. Uh, and if you go back to the beginning of philosophy, uh, Socrates, Plato, and so on, these were being called dialogues, you know, the Socratic dialogues and so on. But for technology's purposes, a good conversation between people usually generates all sorts of different tangents. And that's what I wanted the book to be about. Um, so we also got some pretty interesting kind of ideas around the book as an exhibition. And when I was working on it, um, we did a whole exhibition process where I commissioned a group of artists to come up with imaginary app covers. And the idea, we had, this exhibition was in Sydney uh, at, at this design university. So you walked into the gallery space and we did an open source call. We had thousands of submissions, lots and lots of submissions. Um, and the idea, the only rule for it was that it had to be an app graphic design for an app that didn't exist. So we called it an imaginary app, uh, the exhibition. And so all these people started turning in crazy graphics. And when you walk through the space, there are zillions and zillions of app covers of apps for tools that didn't <laughs> exist. And so the idea was to get this idea of a creative economy going and imagining the near future of how apps would change what you would be able to do. Um, so all sorts of people turned in crazy ideas about apps and you know, kind of arts and graphics. But for my purposes, I wanted as much as possible to get people to think about how those graphics would interface with the creative tools. You know, what is an app but software given an interface that you can you know, manipulate, touch, and move on? So, are these online? Yeah, the exhibition is online. So, for me at least, um, the point of entry for my work in that is uh, here. And this is my book before the Imaginary App. And all of these are with MIT, by the way, MIT Press. So I did a book called Sound Unbound. And in this book, I tracked down the gentleman who invented the record cover sleeve. You're going to see a convergence here in a second. But when you think about uh, the gentleman who invented the record cover sleeve, this is considered generally the first album cover. It's already a collage. You can easily see this is a marquee from uh, kind of Times Square. And these are sort of circular layers going on. And this is generally considered the first graphic record cover sleeve. So in the 1920s and 1930s, many records were blank. And you'd go into a record store and there'd be a gray sleeve. And so this gentleman, uh, his name's Alex Steinweiss, he's usually considered to be the inventor of the record cover sleeve. And the graphics that you can see, that's his studio. It's a very small desk, a very specific rule set of these little squares. So he went into uh, Columbia and said, look, why don't we put an image on the record cover to give people an idea of what the music sounds like? And amusing enough and strange enough, if you start thinking about visualizing music and getting to the point where you have graphics as a kind of an interface for people to engage the music, um, this changed the course of evolution for graphic design for the 20th century. Um, and amusing enough, if you start going back to 2007, it's now been 10 years since the iPhone came out and I asked you guys who had an iPhone, for example, you can easily see the relationship to apps. So when Steve Jobs uh, was coming out with Apple uh, computers and he was trying to figure out graphics, uh, there was Xerox Park, there was a couple other places where those graphics uh, and the tools and the software were essentially just kind of needed a, a, a push visually. They, you know, people had a very difficult time uh, interfacing with the code and they realized if you put graphics on it and layer the graphics, you get an idea of what the software is like. Much in the same way, as I was saying earlier, if you see an album cover, you get an idea of what the music's like. So the fun part about comparing apps and graphic design is th these are just tools for the imagination. Um, and so the reason I called my book The Imaginary App is that we wanted as much as possible to get people to think conceptually about code. It wasn't about what code you're writing, it wasn't about what language you're writing, but it had to be about the idea. Um, and I wanted to encourage the people who participated in the book to get rid of the normal rules and try and think more conceptually about the way code and dimensionalizing the idea of code works. So uh, for example, uh, when he's drawing these, there's a very specific rule set. And that's, that very specific rule set, you know, one could argue, was meant, what made something was very simple generated deep structural complexity. 
that influenced the course of the entire 20th century, and now 21st. So if we dial out from that to apps, you can easily see the same logic at work, except these are all things that are extremely uh, built for both copies and your, there's not necessarily original objects. They're all about the dematerialization I was talking about earlier. So here we are in 2017, it's been 10 years since the iPhone came out. Um, it's been you know several decades since most people uh, could be able to afford a computer. And if you go back a little earlier, um, computers and the idea of how computing would affect daily life, the way we live now would have been wildly, you know, highly unlikely because of the sheer expense of making a computer. Um, so if you're going to the time period when he was doing it, the computers obviously didn't exist. All this was drawn by hand and had to be replicated by hand. So to me at least as an artist, this is a really interesting conversation not just between images and the ecosystems of how images and graphics go through our culture, but above all, the politics and perception, how people begin to think about these notions of economics, how they think about scarcity, how copies and the culture of copies comes home to roost at every level. So whenever you touch an app, you're actually touching a whole layer of graphics that are meant to be activated. So to me at least, that's a really good foundation for today's conversation. I'm gonna leave that to both politics, to art, and above all to some of the issues that drive my own work. So uh, in the book, we tracked down a gentleman who did the first spoof app, this guy, Armand Heinrich, and he did an app called I Am Rich. Um, I used this in the introduction, introduction to the book, and basically it was the first fake app on the, uh, Apple, the iTunes store. And um, basically it was a lifestyle category, which I found really funny. It didn't do anything except if you had this icon on your phone, it was meant to show that you were rich. And so if you'd be at a club or if you're out at night, people, you know, people have their phones and they're doing stuff, and you were just meant to glance at that. And like Saudi princes started downloading it, Russian oligarchs, quirky people went, and it was the most expensive app. Well, it was $999.99. And so um, it was meant to be this, he thought it was an art statement or like a trickster or a joke, but actually real wealthy people started downloading it. And um, it was, <laughs> and it was meant to be, as an art statement, uh, something that was meant to show if someone collects work but it's a copy, what's the value, and it's meant to be a paradox of what you call uh, a Veblen good. There was an economist named Thorsten Veblen who came up with it, he called this sort of the economy of leisure. So if you're very wealthy, that means you have to have emblems of status, which is a Picasso painting or Warhol or a very expensive app that doesn't do anything. Um, so Apple found out that it was an art spoof, and then they made him pull it down, and then he put it on Google Play. And so there was a sense of humor about how uh, these two police systems work. So I begin the book with that, and I thought it was a kind of a sense of humor about how people look at apps and, and you know, whether wealth. If I can get an app for free, I'm going to get it for free. I'm not going to pay $999. Probably most people in this room would not want to pay $999. So um, I also have developed apps. And so one of the apps I developed around the same time was this. It's the DJ Mixer. And um, it was a app that lets you DJ from your phone. This is a very early uh, kind of prototype. But we were usually in the top 10 for iTunes, and it was free. And basically, there's the pro version, and then there's the, uh, the more you know, premium. So that's DJ Spooky, that's this one. So what I did was work with an Israeli group of software developers, and we were all talking back and forth, again, a good conversation, saying, hey, what would people want if they're going to have music on their phone? And I'm going to say, well, the idea of the playlist has already killed the album. Nobody's going to listen to that. Again, like when you saw that album I was showing you guys earlier, people are going to be listening to fragments of songs. They're not, maybe if they're on their phone. In New York, you see everyone jogging with little earplugs, and no one's talking to each other. They all have little earplugs, and everyone's just in their own world. But to take that to a different level, why not have them be able to DJ from their phone? So uh, a light bulb went off during the conversation, and I worked with a group of uh, software develop developers from Tel Aviv, so this is my first app, and we had about 15 million downloads. We were the first DJ app on iTunes. It was wildly popular, and it was free. So it's 15 million zeros going to my bank account. But um, so the idea of tools and dematerialization, this is a very practical, very pragmatic thing. People need tools to work with the devices they have around them. Um, so I'll just give you a quick demo. Um, say, for example, I'm remixing the Beatles uh, this year because it's the 20th anniversary. Uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Band. 50. Oh, sorry, 50th. Thank you for that. And um, to me at least, 
This is their album cover from 1967. And again, you can see that collage effect already. They have all their influences and they've even made copies of themselves. So this is kind of a sense of humor about um, this album was one, considered usually one of the most famous conceptual albums in rock. Um, and so uh, I'll play, I'm getting a little on, ahead of myself here, but just wanted to show you this as a current project and we're releasing this. Um, and yeah, there we go. <laughs> We're releasing this uh, in June, if you guys want. It, it'll be on iTunes and so on. Um, so the first sort of official DJ to remix this, and amusing enough, there's zillions of bootlegs, but you know, this is official. Um, so the fun part about going back to both graphic design, like as I've spoken about earlier, uh, copyright control, and then above all, copies, is that um, you have to imagine that where this is going is not only thinking about analog versus digital, because you remember, you know, vinyl, you play it on a record, and then once that's digitized, anyone can copy it, anyone can edit it. And if it's part of that ecosystem that I spoke about earlier, I can just download millions and millions of songs from iTunes, and then pull them straight onto my iPad app. So, for example, if I just downloaded, uh, let's see, uh, Mr. Mustard. Uh, yeah, there you go. That's... So if I do a remix of that, I'll just pull up that one really quick for kicks, uh, and here we go. Exactly like turntables, and even programmed down to the latency of doing the backward turntable swipe and things like that with the DJ. But um, the idea here is that most of that would have been gestures that you would make physically if you're DJing and stuff like that. But um, this was not meant to be "quote unquote" art. It was meant to be a tool. That the difference between art and a tool in, in this era is kind of these are subtle things to think about. Um, and so when it was talking about architecture and design, um, to me it's really fascinating to think about patterns. So what you're seeing here is a data set. If I'm able to break apart a song pretty quickly, these are, it does what you call auto beat analysis and breaks the song apart into edit points. So any of those can be selected, looped, edited, and mixed with other stuff. You can pull the voices out of songs, you can do all sorts of stuff. But I'm just using this as an example of a tool. Um, and when you start thinking about how that multiplies the effect of sampling and collage and all the things I've been just riffing on here, that means you're, you're, you're basically being able to DJ with any digital media file that you have access to. You can just pull it in from, I'll just click really quickly, SoundCloud, Google Music, Spotify. And so if that app means you have access to millions and millions and millions of songs, and you can remix all those songs, um, then there's a whole kind of really intriguing approach that one of my favorite theoreticians of this concept is Buckminster Fuller. And he had a, a book called, I Seem to be a Verb, which means that this is not uh, something that's resting, it's always a movement. A verb is something that's engaged. Um, and when you start to think about sound, and memory, and art, those are things that lead you back to that idea I was talking about earlier. Hey, you don't be late. No, no problem. Um, and amusingly enough, um, I have to imagine that with you all, I'm imagining most of the people in the room uh, are probably less than 30, just guessing. And I, you know, I can only imagine, does anybody buy, buy vinyl anymore? Okay. <laughs> well, that's a cool thing. Vinyl's coming back, by the way, just, just, you know, just saying. Um, so what we've done is simulate from the tools of one era and dematerialize it and basically digitize them to tools for our current era. Now, by the way, the architect who coined the term information architecture, his name's Richard Saul Worman. Uh, if you haven't, uh, if you're not aware of his work, he also helped start the TED conference, which is uh, uh, now run by Chris Anderson. Those are they're two interesting people whose, whose take on this stuff is, is you know, interesting. All right, so that's one project that comes out in a little bit. Now let's pull you into a different project. Uh, recently, I also had an exhibition of this project, which is called The Golden Record. And this was at the Vancouver uh, Museum of Contemporary Art. 
uh, the National Gallery. And uh, basically it's a remix of the first record to leave the solar system. Um, and the installation is essentially set up, again, you remix it, and also uh, this is the, the exhibition project. But if, amusing enough, um, what this is was curated by Carl Sagan, who is a very renowned scientist, and they needed to figure out if you were going to put a record on a satellite, if the Voyager satellite has basically been in, you know, going since the late 70s, uh, you're going to put a record on it, and maybe in several millennia, when that satellite finally gets to wherever Fox and Centauri and Alpha Centauri, that there's going to be an alien civilization that'll have a record player. <laughs> Um, and so when you go to the exhibition, you see this kind of idea of, I was like, well, what would aliens and human beings have in common? I doubt they're going to be listening to Led Zeppelin or Led Belly or anything. So we made the record into different math patterns that are uh, this kind of barcode, and it's an open source initiative. Um, Ken, you're, you're Dave, David Pestovich just experienced Yeah, I was wondering, did you involved with that? No, I, I yeah. did it totally independently. <laughs> uh, he, he read about my project, and I read about his, uh, and we both texted each other. Yo, I heard you're remixing, or you're putting that one out. Okay. I was just texting him right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd heard about his, and he had heard this kind of, because this was like super artsy in a gallery, mm -hmm. and it was a show called The Mashup, The History of the Mashup. Um, and it's a great catalog, but none of us had heard about his, which came out a couple months later, and then I was reading, and I was like, I, I, I Google alerts for Golden you know, Record. And I said, David Pesquets, of course, David, that sounds like. But this was earlier, just by a couple months. So this is going to be a project that's going to tour. And intriguing enough, if you're aware of it, it's really fascinating to think about how they chose the songs and material that would be on the album. And it was slightly controversial because it was meant to be an album that would be an acoustic portrait of Earth. And it, had, it was meant to have every major language and specific examples of body language and other things that if you were an alien civilization, you'd be able to get what Earth was from that record. Um, and I mean, it's, the logic of it is kind of, it's very 70s, like imagining that uh, you get to another solar system and some aliens are gonna have a record player, and they're like, oh, I need to understand Earth better, let me play this record. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a good, it's a fun idea, but I doubt it's very practical, and I doubt aliens are gonna have you know, um, turntables. But, cool idea. So. Can you play a sample from the sound of it? Uh, it's all over the web. If you just Google Golden Record, just because time and space be what it is. Um, it's just songs and selections from that were from different regions of um, Earth that were general enough that if you meant to like structurally understand how language or different uh, musician kind of, so they had Bach, you know, they had uh, uh, Little Richard, and all sorts of collection of random, but curated by Carl Sagan. Um, and, you know, by the way, all the stuff I'm talking about is open source, except the Beatles, I have to admit that one. They have serious lawyers and copyrights. So, so um, if, if you like any of these projects, they're all on my website, and there's bits and pieces that are all downloaded. So that project was meant to highlight, if you're going to take an acoustic portrait of the planet, let's put it in the context of sampling, because if you're never going to be able to represent everything, you'll be able to take some of the best fragments and then make that mix available and then put it on the side of a satellite and see what happens. Uh, but if you're doing an exhibition of that, how would you dimensionalize that as well? So these are just kind of meant to be bits and pieces that I've given you guys a sense of how my <laughs> works. But they also had this concept of the Vitruvian Man, which is a very famous image from the Renaissance. And if you start thinking about proportion and ratio, this was uh, one of the main inspirations that worked with that project of the Golden Record. And the circularity is apparent immediately. And they're meant to be proportional to the human body, and they wanted to show how that would you know, be visualized. Again, who knows? The families are going to even have eyes, I mean, really. But if you're Carl Sagan, you can put a golden record on the satellite because it's cool. It is very cool. So I love this idea that we're looking at symbols and logic and this idea of acoustic portraits. <coughs> so I've been giving you guys a very artsy approach here, and I'm hopefully I'm not losing everybody, but the idea is that. First and foremost, uh, the sort of foundation of the practice I'm talking about is like looking at found objects and then taking those apart and thinking about them and trying to put them together with different approaches stylistically and above all, collage and appropriation is a kind of key component. Um, so another project that I think hopefully will give you a sense of what's going on is I'm very interested in how um, art and design look at uh, the politics of perception. 
So uh, a little while ago, I was curated by the artist Ai Weiwei, he's an old associate, and in Beijing, he, was, um, he has a compound that he would do a series of kind of artist happenings and events, and then eventually he was put under house arrest by the uh, Chinese secret police, long story. But at that time, right before that, he had curated the Guangzhou Biennale. Um, so I'll just show you that really quickly. And um, basically, he, he was like, Paul, do you have any projects coming up? We're going to do some uh, curating the spot Daniel, which is a big deal for Korea. Uh, so I said, sure. I had just gone to Antarctica. And um, he said, well, why don't you try and maybe put the Antarctic project in the Biennial? So I took a studio to Antarctica and went to all of the main ice fields. And again, this idea of doing an acoustic portrait. Um, this, this project was around 2009 to 11, and it's still ongoing. So I, basically, I carried a backpack and went to Antarctica to many of the main ice fields. And I was there for six weeks uh, recording and doing all the stuff with data and getting climate data, specifically about the way climate was changing and radically melting the ice. So I'll give you just a quick observation here. If you zoom in, and this is just one example, you can see how that mountain has been scraped uh, by the, the sinking of this huge, I mean, this is a massive glacier. And um, it took hours to walk up there from the water's edge. And this is a different viewpoint. But um, this was at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and we had a series of initiatives around how would you do data solidification of different kinds of ice. So uh, people would say, oh, this is a very beautiful photography, looks great, interesting. But to me, this is a portrait of devastation because there's no ice. As a matter of fact, you should be, this whole area should be frozen over, and you're just seeing water. Uh, so the temperature differentials between how we think about what's comfortable for human beings and above all, the sense of beauty, that's what in the 19th century they would have called the sublime. You know, the philosopher Edmund Burke, or even earlier Immanuel Kant, uh, the, the idea of the sublime in one era leads you to sort of almost devastation and destruction because we're not really able to think about the human scale versus the geologic scale versus literally the planetary scale. Um, so what we've done is just take this entire idea of planetary cycles and systems and accelerate it and light it on fire at that point. So um, these photographs and the concert, I'm going to show you how this turned into a group of music compositions. But above all, for me, the art of this is not just about what you're seeing, but about the absence. And so the compelling idea here is that art is about kind of capturing or attempting to capture that sort of immaterial and very difficult to distill distinction between the physical and the immaterial. Um, so if you think of this as beauty, and the idea of the sublime, going back to those <coughs> philosophical concepts earlier, it's actually total devastation. And so you're trying to turn that upside down and think about that sense of beauty and the fragility of nature, which uh, there's a, a book by Bill McKibbin called The End of Nature. So we're now in the, what you call the Anthropocene era, where human actions have impacted the planet so much that we've actually radically transformed it and, and sent out this anthropomorphic sensibility of time, space, and above all, pattern. So what I did was work with a group of scientists uh, out of Dartmouth's Cold Regions Research Labs, uh, led by Ross A. Virginia. And the first step I want to do about ice was look at it very closely. So these are all um, basically ice crystals. And what you're seeing here is a hexagonal form. And anyone who is into math, you can see there's a kind of recursive logic at work. And when you see a piece of ice, you're actually seeing the same thing folded in on itself from multiple uh, angles. So you can see that hexagonal shape. Just to give you another example, still the hexagonal shape, but the folds and the edges and the geometry. So there's, a, there's an implicit mathematics in nature that's incredibly beautiful. But again, once we start thinking about devastation and destruction or human sort of impact, um, that beauty becomes kind of deeply troubling because we're, we're not sure, A, if you know, how long these you know, major land masses of the Arctic and Antarctic are going to be lasting, but above all, that, that transience and impermanence. So when you're walking through a snowstorm, you have to think you're walking through a certain kind of mathematics, um, the, the wind, the ice, the snow, and so on. So there's a science to this that was based on um, the equations from this gentleman, uh, Johannes Kepler. And he's generally considered to be the prototype of a modern scientist, him and Galileo, generally. Uh, so in 1611, he was on his way home, and a snowflake landed on his sleeve. And um, he was stunned by the geometry of it, and he went home and wrote this essay, Six Sides of a Snowflake, 
Uh, generally, this is considered one of the first major treatises on mathematics in nature. So, um, Six Eyes of Snowflake, if you look it up, it's really fascinating because he was trying to figure out geometry in nature. Um, and Kepler was an eccentric and brilliant mind, so was Galileo. Um, and one of the major issues both him and Galileo did was change perception. <laughs> At that time, the Earth was considered the center of the universe, and the Pope, or the, or the Catholic faith, would put you to the stake if you said the Earth was the center. Of, I'm sorry, the Sun was the center of our you know, galaxy or our solar system. Um, so that was controversial. And at his time, making that science as a statement around fact and information and being able to systematically engage the scientific aspect of research and generate math and other equations that to this day we can still reference, that's a powerful statement. So I wanted to take his information and make equations out of it. So I worked with the, um, the Dartmouth Cold Regions Research Labs, generated uh, these max patches, this is um, max MSP, and we took the equations from Kepler, ran it through Maximus P, and we were able to use it to generate very specific algorithms that would generate visual ice. Um, so this is mathematical equations, specifically of those running through that software, and we are able to generate this is a very precise mathematic description of hexagonal permutation. And you can easily see the, you know, the permutation of the permutation going into many, many cycles of itself until you finally get to um, this, which is actually uh, pure mathematic uh, distillation of all those equations into the hexagonal shape, folded and folded and folded and folded and folded into itself. Um, so that's the science, but there's also a poetic. Um, and I love just sort of using this as a, as a counterpoint here. So this is Iceberg Slim. Um, if anybody knows hip hop, uh, he's from the West Coast, but black people, we love ice. You know, we have Iceberg Slim, Ice Tea, Ice Cube. If you get the white guy, you have vanilla ice. You know, so there's a sense of humor about the poetic aspect of that as it's translated into hip hop, which is be, being cold or being cool. Uh, and the sense of humor here is that you have the poetic versus the scientific, and how do you navigate that if you're thinking about art and science, which I definitely am. So I wanted you guys to kind of riff on that, and this is a great album cover, as he's just sitting on this huge pile of ice. Uh, he also helped popularize, I'll just zoom in there, the Jerry Curl. I don't know if you guys have seen that. <laughs> uh, you know, it's the West Coast, you know, it was very popular, with like NWA, you know, Ice Cube. Uh, so those guys all started having that hair, hairstyle. Um, so basically what I want you guys to think about is, first and foremost, you've got a sense of your cell phones, software design, and mobile. And then on the other hand, you have this idea of using data to generate a music composition. Now, how does that work? Uh, what I did was take the climate data, these are the temperature differentials, um, and we ran those through a couple of uh, music software patches, and we were able to generate tones from that. And those tones uh, were able to then be sequenced, and I'll, I'm going to play you this just to give you a sensibility of what it sounds like. Um, and you distill, 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 and then you finally get what you call algorithmic musical transcription, where we both have the temperature differentials and the tone registers between um, how those patterns would play out. So, uh, what does this sound like? Well, I, I notated it to music form and then did a project uh, called Of Water and Ice. And basically what I did was take that sense of geometry and um, make an album out of it. And on top of that, we had a big installation project um, and book. So this is the book. It was called The Book of Ice. Um, and every part of it, we, the guy who wrote the introduction, uh, Brian Greene, he's a, a physicist, and his most famous book is called The Elegant Universe. Um, so what I did was work with him to get more equations and other material that would be used to generate uh, material for the book, and then generated a whole bunch of graphics. Uh, what, this piece premiered both at the Metropolitan Museum in New York and at Sundance. It was hosted uh, by this gentleman, Robert Redford. So you went into the exhibition, and there were different loops and layers of different kinds of ice melting, and it would make this composition. And so you'd go in, and all these different screens would have different kind of ice melted. And you would hear kind of an acoustic, you know, kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, composite. And so uh, what I want to do is play you one of the pieces from that. And I made the whole album open source. Here's the cover. Um, and the fun part about this is that Antarctica is the only place on Earth with no government. And I'm going to get into a little bit more of the politics in a moment. But because there's no government, I made the whole project open source. And the idea was to show that scientific data could be used to generate a composition, and then you could have the underlying data be used to make remixes. Because why not? There's no government. 
thus no copyright. Uh, but it's still data, and it's still very specific information. So uh, we put this online, we've had almost a million downloads of it, it's been very popular, uh, and it's been, you know, again, because it's one of the only albums made, it's literally the pure sound of ice, and it's remixable and open source. Uh, we had a really good run with it, we ended up uh, getting a big award from National Geographic, and a couple other really interesting environmental activist groups. So, let's play you that for a second here. So what you're going to hear is I've taken this, a woman's, uh, had a singer sing some of the equations and then make small loops of it. So I'll just play you that. Regretfully, we don't have much bass, but you'll just hear. So she's singing just some of the kind of uh, tangent points, and then we're going to do a permutation. So in philosophical terms, some people like uh, Deleuze and Watari would call this the changing sayings. And the beauty of that is that there's a, what you call movement of minimalism in classical music, people like Steve Reich or Philip Glass. And then on the other end of the spectrum, with hip hop, techno, dubstep, uh, much of the music that comes out of the urban context, there's this idea of a layered motif. Um, so this project as an album and this project as a kind of sensibility engaging science and music uh, really had a good run, and it was a, real, a pleasure to uh, have that go out. And I'll just I'll show you what a concert that would look like as well. And this is a, at the Metropolitan Museum. Um, the backdrop was done um, where we were projecting all this blue kind of tones throughout the museum. And it's uh, the architecture and design was done with Terra Terraform. Uh, they're a really interesting architecture group. Uh, Mitchell Joachim is also the architect in residence for the TED conference. So we had him uh, do this kind of that's me as a dot down there. And we had a really good sized crowd. It looks very, very smoothed out, but that's the way the architects take photos, I guess. But, um, so when you look at a concert of that, and you were just hearing these sounds, the thing about it was when we had it unfold in Korea at the Guangzhou Biennale, I'll show you, um, I had specifically said, hey, why don't we do a kind of a presentation of that as a live concert? So here's me at the opening, and what we did was have these cranes come up and put huge squares around the museum so we could project different kinds of ice against the museum. Um, so when you come to the opening, you would see all this different kind of ice in the building if you be projected with all these blue kind of geometric forms. And so this is uh, when we were setting it up, there's these big cranes coming in and putting uh, the screens up. And then by the time uh, the opening happened, we had about 10,000 people at the opening. And you can see, regretfully, the lighting was kind of you're way back here on the side, all these glares coming from the lights. So you can see, and I'm, I'm down here DJing, like here, that's me. <laughs> um, so there's, you know, we had, a, it's a huge opening, and regretfully, amusingly enough, and this is going to turn into a little bit of politics here, um, Iowa didn't show up to the opening because he was at the Beijing airport and had been captured or taken by secret police and put in some van and taken to some secret uh, base, and he was uh, under. I don't know, it was uh, not a good time for him. Um, so we were calling, trying to figure out where he was. He wasn't answering his phone. <laughs> Obviously he's like, hi, I'm being tortured in a Chinese street prison, sorry. And that's my message though. But, um, <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So it was a beautiful opening, really interesting, and a pleasure to think about this idea of moving between music, art, and science. Those are the three things that I think, hopefully, the takeaway today will be that it's about patterns and pattern recognition. So that's one project. Now, this is going to lead me to one other one, and I know it's almost five, so I want to kind of keep it brisk, and I know we're going to just open up the questions. A current project that's going to be going on this summer um, besides that is I'm remixing the composer Richard Wagner. And I've been working on a series of graphic design prints. Uh, so, so this is going to be at the Wagner Museum in Bayreuth, uh, which is in Germany. And uh, what we're going to do is take uh, Wagner's, uh, some of his major materials, and uh, remix them and apply this idea. He has a very famous phrase where he says, imagination creates reality. And he had a series of philosophical disputes with the philosopher Nietzsche. And him and uh, Friedrich Nietzsche were very good friends. And Wagner's uh, Ring Cycle Opera and Nietzsche's philosophy uh, were meant to be this kind of critique on one hand of romanticism, and on the other hand of the philosophical concepts of how uh, this idea of the changing of rationalism uh, was leading to romanticism, a new critique of nature. And amusingly enough, Nietzsche has this one famous phrase, which everybody always loves to try it out, but there's a lot more, where he says, God is dead, which is, there's a, so humanity had displaced the divine and, and somehow created the anthropocene. And again, that's something that's going to come back, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring it to that in a moment. So, Wagner, as a composer, was also an architect. And I'm going to show this. This is an opera house he designed in Bayreuth, where I'm going to have my, one of the projects. And this is an infamous space, because during World War II, um, Hitler was a huge Wagner fan. And in Germany, uh, in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, the idea of controlling the arts became a very implicit and powerful statement by that movement that Hitler was a part of. And they also said, look, anybody who's not German, we're going to call that untata de Kunst, which means degenerate art. So Jews, blacks, gays, anybody who wasn't a white guy, you know, blue guys, whatever, they basically said that's terrible art and get rid of the Jews and the blacks and so on. So he hated jazz, he hated anything that was like Jewish composers and so on. And so they would have these kind of rallies and Hitler would stand on this balcony and do his crazy stuff. And intriguingly enough, um, because Wagner was also a composer, the acoustics of that space were designed to amplify the voice. And so if you go to any of the operas there, so one could, ar one could argue that Hitler, eerily enough, was part of this insane art situation that was, like, I mean, you gotta imagine, this is all graphics, and amusing enough, if you're Buddhist or Hindu, this symbol means something very different in their culture. That's not to say that, uh, I, it's just weird that he's repurposing and taking symbols from other cultures, and to, the eternal detriment, that symbol is actually a symbol of very profound um, symbolic meaning in South Asian culture and has now been turned into a horrible, terrible situation in the West. Um, I'm not going to, that's a different topic, but when you start thinking about repurposing and transforming and doing, you know, remixes can be a double edged sword. You know? So if this is a graphic design component that for many people, for me, example, if I see the, I'll give you an example. If I see the Confederate flag, I, I, I feel awful, and it's like not cool, and it's really terrible. Uh, and I'm sure for many people in South Asia, if they see that, they'd be, why does this guy with a mustache take one of our favorite symbols and fuck it up? You know, so it's, there's, there's a lot of weird things. So long story short, what we're going to do is remix the building. And so this is, I took a photograph in front of it, a sense of humor. Um, what we're going to do is project on this opera house this summer, and I'm going to have a whole group of string ensembles that I'm going to be sampling. And I'll be, uh, we're going to do what you call 3D volumetric projection on that opera house. And um, so intriguing enough and strangely enough, Wagner is generally considered to be one of the, the par excellent composers of German you know, kind of stuff. I prefer vastly Bach, personally. But um, so that opera house is meant to be a composition. And it's also meant to be this eerily political uh, kind of context around the very deeply uneasy relationship between politics, arts, and above all, classical music. So that's one project, and again, it'll be open source. If you go back, if you check back around June-ish, it'll be. Hey, Kim. So, well, oh, thank you. Um, so you have to imagine all these projects are really different. You, you one, you've seen a record that's going to be the first record to leave the solar system. Another, you've seen a DJ go to Antarctica and make records out of ice. Another project, you've seen a book done with a quantum physicist. Um, each, and another book done with a mathematician like Stephen Wolfram called the Imaginary App. So project to project to project, what is the common denominator? And from my point of view, it's about patterns and the way they kind of manifest in culture. So 
when I'm looking at Wagner, he coined the term Gesamtkunstwerk, which in German simply means total artwork. Um, and amusingly enough, someone who's a Gesamtkunstler um, is meaning some, someone who's a total artist who's playing with all of these different variables. Um, so, uh, Greg, is that a good term? Gesamtkunstler? Kunstler, yeah, if you could say that. Yeah. Okay, there you can see. See, he's German. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so, when you think about the 21st century, we are all media artists, right? Because our phones, our ideas of mobile media, all those things have allowed to democratize these tools. And so what I'm trying to figure as an artist, and this is a provocation perhaps to you all as an audience, is where does it stop? And how does, for that matter, if you're a composer like Wagner, orchestras will play note for note for centuries, that composition. Uh, if you're Bach or if you're Warhol or whatever, those are all people who did what you call finished works. You have the work, it's done. Uh, it goes on somebody's wall, an orchestra plays it. But for someone like me, it's the unfinished work. You can just open the file up and change it. So that idea of digital media and the unfinished work is now something that's very intriguing and kind of tension with the normal, what I call the normal art world, where essentially people want to create scarcity, you know, painting, sculptures, whatever. And then in the digital world, it's all about the copy, because you're, you're just having all these multiple copies, in fact, infinite. Anything that's digital can be copied. So if you're remixing a building and you're thinking about architecture, remember I showed you guys that phrase at the beginning, how does that transform the relationship to um, how we think about physicality, the body, and above all, the way information itself shapes the world uh, that we perceive around us. So those are just provocations putting out there. All right, so um, one of the other projects, and it's five o'clock, where are we should start a conversation? We'll start, okay. One last project um, is I've been going to India for the last several months as well. Um, and one of the things that struck me, this is a, um, I'm gonna just sort of, this is, it was so hot last year, at record level temperatures, and the streets were melting. And um, basically I was recording a project about the um, Indian river systems. And I went to the Ganges River. And um, regretfully, you can't see, but the water was so low. You see those brown marks? That's where the water should be, and that's where all these people are. So the, the river system, uh, the Ganges River is collapsing and sinking down more and more and more. And it's astoundingly beautiful. This is a city called Varanasi. Yeah. And so what I did was go to the most major rivers of India and made a series of what I call acoustic portraits of the different kind of river systems. And that project is still in development, but it was inspired by um, conversation. And uh, again, this is me talking to a group of Indian master musicians. And I went, I went and visited several of their major temples. And, and the main one that I went and visited was the um, Temple of Manakshi. And she's the, 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 the goddess of the city. Um, and what's fascinating about that is that this is one of the earliest architectural forms. And if you zoom in, you can see all these divinities. They're all just crazy spirits and what, you know, different characters from the myths. And they built this, this huge temple uh, made from all the fragments of characters that respond to that specific mythology and that specific uh, religious and other kinds of philosophical engagement. So, you go to this temple and you meet some of the major master musicians. And I even got blessed by an elephant. <laughs> um, you know, so they, there's temple musicians who sing. And amusing enough, it's intriguing enough, India invented the concept of zero. And the West didn't have zero up until Fibonacci bought it over from the Arabs. And the Arabs had bought it over from the Indians. So whenever you look at the number one, two, three, and so on, those are called Arabic numerals. But amusing enough, they're actually Sanskrit. So, long story short, the Western tuning system comes out of Greece, and if you think about minor chord or major chord or any of those, there's a whole system that's put in place, mainly uh, by Pythagoras and a couple other mathematicians, about music and geometry. Um, I'll leave it at that, but basically, whenever you hear Western music, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, whatever, Wagner, they're going to these tuning systems that have been in place since the ancient Greeks, but they didn't have zero. So if you go to India, on the other hand, they're like, oh yeah, we've had zero for thousands of years. You guys are just getting it. Come on. So there was a famous conversation between Einstein and this gentleman, uh, Rabindranath Tagore. And basically, Einstein, when he was in the middle of finishing up his theory of relativity, um, he had just won the Nobel Prize for uh, the general theory of relativity. And the gentleman next to him, Tagore, had just won the uh, Nobel Prize uh, for poetry about physics and sound. So they had a conversation that uh, they recorded and then turned into a really interesting philosophical debate uh, that was called, the book is just called The Nature of Reality. 
And so I, re I was reading through this book and was thinking about the idea of physics and the West and the way the West is always trying to figure out how to kind of quantify and engage this notion of very specific ways of limiting the idea of data and how it impacts on the world. Meanwhile, in India, where they've had zero, they've had the idea of multiple universes, where they had had all sorts of um, different approaches to how math would unfold in everyday life, they, you know, they were in the idea of multiple universes and all sorts of really amazing mathematics and astrophysics way before the West, but it was part of their sort of combined you know, natural philosophy. So if you ever have a free plane ride or an evening, it's a great read. It's just called The Nature of Reality. Um, so taking their conversation as a starting point, I then started looking at the math of rivers and then uh, started working on how river systems um, kind of could influence. And I was also doing photography and this is my photography. This was in National Geographic. So I started wandering across some of the major river systems of India. Uh, I was there for six weeks um, and doing photography and then look, working and talking with master musicians uh, who had looked at the mathematics of that region. And I also worked with a very renowned Indian uh, architect named Gita Mehta, who's the head of architecture at Columbia University. And she also, we had some really, yeah, this is Gita here. And um, one of the beautiful things about working with architects who happen to have access to satellite system maps is we were able to get a tremendous amount of data and start distilling that into some pretty cool imagery. Um, so I'm still working on that, and it'll be probably into late next year. Let me show you if I have any of those photos. But um, basically, what you guys are hearing is hopefully a, a very informal, relaxed conversation about a batch of current projects. Um, there's a lot more, uh, but I want to keep it within the time frame. So, um, if anybody has any questions, um, I can easily show other projects, but I do want to make sure that we have time. By the way, this is just some of the uh, exhibition images of the Antarctica project. So I made this graphic design prints uh, that was called Propaganda for a Potential or Hypothetical World here. Um, and those prints have gone to a whole bunch of museum collections and so on. Um, and I've did it in over 17 different languages. So, um, yeah, that's the book of ice. And the river project will have a similar trajectory. So, with that said and done, um, Greg, should we open up? There's other projects, but I know we have a tight uh, time frame. So, yeah. Woo! Yeah. Let's see if you have any questions for Paul tonight. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, this is super interesting, uh, just like the mashup exhibition was in Vancouver. Um, I kind of want to argue a little bit about this notion of like, or question you a bit more about this, like, your sort of assertion that like an orchestral score is kind of like a fixed, like, performance, a fixed object. Because to me, as, as a violinist, like, you know, a score in the library or photocopies is like, you know, you can read it and get an idea in your mind, but until you have a, you know, an orchestra actually performing it, like, you know, it's not a real thing. And and if it were a fixed thing, then like there would be no point in like having orchestras perform like pieces. So could you sort of say a little sure, bit? Like, like I do think like you when you said like there's limits on like the orchestra. Like you can think of the orchestra like hall and the whole sort of dying ecosystem of classical music as like limits. But <laughs> you know, could you sort of say a bit more about that? Absolutely. And thank you so much for bringing that up. Let's let's unpack that for a second because first and foremost. The notes are the same. I mean, if you're playing Bach, yeah. or Mozart, or Bach, or whatever, their cultural system in place of notation is very specific. Now, people can take that and go different. And also, every musician's going to have a slight interpretation of the bowing, or like if they have any kind of pattern in that orchestra. If they have a conductor that you know happens to kind of give them the wrong, you know, or you can slow it down to conduct. I'm sure you've seen when the conductors are moving. And that's human, so there's going to be variations in the time and, and the kind of signature approach. But on the other end of the spectrum, the, um, the idea is that, yes, it's still note for note, it's very specific. Um, but you can remix and transform it, but it's still about those notes. Um, and what I've done with my own work is start thinking about those notes as a kind of a generative system. I don't think of um, art as fixed format, but I do think of things as a kind of uh, generative beginning. So um, I, don't, I wouldn't say that we're in disagreement there. What I would say is that 
I don't view it as fixed. And most orchestra or composers would be like, hey, you know, I wrote it that way, I want the orchestra to play it that way. And there are some people, there's, there's some younger composers who are coming up now, many of whom I have referenced, for example. I, re I enjoy the, the works of people like uh, Gabriel Prokofiev or uh, Mason Bates, who actually studied here, or uh, the, the composer, the Indian composer Vijay Iyer. Uh, I think he studied here too, I think. But, um, and uh, there's, there's many other composers whose work I, I really think about quite a bit. But I also think that we need to kind of reinvigorate and maybe reinterpret. And here we go. This is some of the river systems that I'm looking at in the video from above. Um, and I got, I got access to the satellite footage. So these are still patterns. I, did, I just want to leave that up while we're talking. Um, so when you look at an orchestral score versus, uh, like, you know, the vast difference between, say, for example, um, this, this is one of the earliest notated scores available. It's in Sumerian from a couple thousand years ago. And literally, this is like the oldest form of notated music. And they were able to find out that these are very specific, even ways of speaking, these, um, that well, by the time they got it down, um, it took decades to be able to translate that. And so too with hieroglyphs, and so too with other kinds of notation systems. But if you think about how Western uh, violinists or cellists would view some motifs uh, from Wagner or something, I mean, I'm just giving that as an example, there's very specific linguistic and semiotic relationships to these symbols. But if you have the literacy with that, you're going to play that, and that's it. But a computer, I could, I could turn it backwards, cut it in half, edit it quickly because I have access to the recording or to the data set. Um, and that doesn't mean that they're mutually exclusive, but it does mean that I would say when I write classical music, I've written for like Kronos Quartet, for example. Uh, they just played one of my last symphony uh, quartet works uh, for a film. Uh, we had to write out everything, and they, you know, but then I had them play it note for note, and then I sampled it, so I was able to remix them for my sound film works, and um, it worked out great. But um, there, I have to admit that that's an issue that you're probably going to be seeing a lot more as more artists who work with digital media do more multi or transdisciplinary approaches to art. But um, yeah, it's one, amusing enough, one could say it's all about the translation. This is maybe a more technical question. You said that for your ICE project, you got a woman sing the equations. Mm -hmm. What does that process look like from taking an equation to having it sound like someone vocalizing? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so the equations were generated from Johannes Kepler, um, and there, there's widely available equations from that. If you just look up online, it's called Six Sides of a Snowflake, and it's definitely out of copyright because it's from 1611. Um, so <laughs> the equations that were based on hybrid um, kind of investigation to hexagonal shape. So what you do is you assign that to tone, and then you have periodicity based on like the way those tones would unfold. Then for my own purposes, with hip hop and techno and all that style of music from the urban context, it's 4-4 four, four tempo, and then very specific uh, pitches that I would, you know, so that narrowed it down, narrowed it down, narrowed it down. Then within that frame, I needed to have something that I would say be fragments that I could put up in a line, which you know, we made the whole album open source. So I didn't have her sing like crazy frequencies. I had her sing within the patterns that would work for hip hop and stuff like that. Um, it's it's pretty. Once you get the idea of plugging those equations in, you're good. I mean, but you, you either like Greg, we're working on this project where they have those bell sounds uh, based on uh, uh, Alan Turing's morphogenesis equations, but they are at a relatively high pitch. Personally, I would shift them down in pitch so they have more bass or stuff like that. But most people just hear this little ping, 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 you know, kind of sound. But if we think of these as, uh, they're just kind of like colors on your palette. But if you still want to respect the idea of intention, like the, the young woman who mentioned, uh, you know, notation and stuff like that, yeah, I, you know, I could write the equations out into normal music notation, which we've done, but I still want to be able to have it remixed. And it's harder. You can still notate a remix, but it, it's almost like it's a different kind of literacy because you're, you're hearing it and you're playing it and you're able to change it very quickly. Notation usually is like someone writing it out and people playing and you have to go back and forth and back and forth. And 
it's a much slower, uh, but I view as a more ponderous uh, process. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of drawing a tangent here, but your um, ice project kind of reminded me of this project Justice Davis. They went to the meeting here with like the earthquake frequencies. I don't know if you worked on that. No, I don't know. That was natural frequencies, yeah. Yeah. That was, um, that, um, Ken and I worked on that actually. Oh, really? Yeah, and uh, that still happens. That's still crazy. So that's in the large field of sonification, uh, which there's a lot Somebody should write a book about how all these sonification projects relate to each other. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, these are related, and uh, uh, we very, very much inspire each other when we look at these things. Oh, we did it that way. I'll do it this way. And well, but I mean, do you, is that is that available as a composition that's free, or you can download, or where would you find it? Is it online? It might be. I actually haven't checked if like the score is available anywhere. But I guess the score changes because it's a real life data stream. Yeah, it's from like so so it depends on how the Earth moves at the moment. Oh. And so the score is written in real time out of the data, and then the, the player looks at the score as it comes up. Hmm. And that, that was fun. It was hard to play though because you never know what happens. Yeah. <laughs> you can't rehearse. Right? <laughs> well, thank you for that. I, I'll have to look that one up. It sounds very. There's other composers who are doing a lot of stuff with data simplification, and, and as Ken had mentioned, there was a, um, a guy named David Peskovitz that also did the Golden Record uh, as a Kickstarter campaign, and they raised um, you know hundreds of thousands of dollars because everyone wanted to hear the, the first Interstellar record. Uh, I I thought well, the amusing of that that record is online; it's free, you know, but the people wanted the vinyl, so. <laughs> Um, you can still find it online for free, or you can pay for the vinyl. You know, so, and I, I always chuckle about the different formats. Like I, the sensors that would go into that kind of earthquake project, I can only imagine they're probably relatively cheap at this point because you have to put them in buildings all over. Right? It's not expensive. You know, well, uh, there's very way, various ways to get the sensors to get data streams going. And there's cheap ones and expensive. Those ones in particular are actually sitting at the core of the Hayward Falls, and they're very hard to get to. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an expedition. Yeah, sure. But I, I, I love the idea that people have to think about gathering this information, and then once they gather it, they have this incredibly rich and very potent mix of material. And then the, the next step is, let's see what we can distill, sort of bring out of it, and what direction we go. And I think you'll be seeing a lot of artists and creators using that kind of palette uh, to come up with new approaches. Um, and uh, the art world is moving slowly away from normal painting and sculpture, or this or that. But meanwhile, the normal classical music scene is very traditionally uh, engaged with the notation systems and that kind of literacy. So I, I think I, my, the project about rivers, I'm definitely going to be doing stuff about the, the ebb and flow. Um, there's a big article I did with National Geographic, I'll share that really quickly. Um, um, and basically, I've been really fascinated with how we can uh, look at you know, this idea of water overall. Because uh, it's, it's the most prevalent material, H2O, hydrogen, as well as a component in the universe. So that's something that could be really um, a rich vein to, to check out. Um, so yeah, this is all. The National Geographic article um, gives a little bit of that as well. But thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. Any your thoughts, questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I really appreciated your your candor in bringing up the the notion of the you know the beauty versus the you know planetary catastrophe devastation. The, yeah, devastation. Um, so and and please, I'm not in any way suggesting a, an association with you, but I had a very profound personal experience last week. I was in New York at the Strand Bookstore, and I ran across um, this amazing um, photograph book from out of France of prisons, you know, of you know, of, uh, and but the photos, it was as if Lenny Riefenstahl had taken them, you know, the barbed wire. You know, becoming you know the razor wire becoming the objet d'art. You know, it's a, so how how do you as an artist 
what's, what's, wh where are you pulled in how you communicate, okay, on one level, you know, this is a certain layer of reality of light playing with water and ice, and on the other hand, you know, it's Dante-esque, you know, it's hell, it's, you know, it's, um, well, what makes you get out of apocalyptic. That I mean, yeah. this morning I woke up and I was uh, listening to um, the news and it was like, you know, Syria, more refugees, right. starvation in Somalia, right. civil war in Sudan, you know, slavery in Thailand, you know, the news was just like, then you yeah. turn another channel right. and it's like, ocean acidification, the Great Barrier Reef is dying, you turn the channel and there's another, you know, like, you know, there's an epidemic of obesity in America, and there's an opioid epidemic, you turn another channel, it's like, just turn the whole thing off. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> Um, and play music. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, this is, these are cynical and grim times. I mean, I have to admit, very, uh, this weekend, one of the other projects I think you're around to mention is I'm hosting um, the March for Science uh, in New York. Uh, I'm sorry, not New York, in Washington, D.C. And we're going to have a whole um, group of artists responding to uh, the Trump administration's erasure of data. And that's it's that's it's very specifically political here. I'll show you that really quickly. It's on Earth Day, April twenty second. If you have any friends in DC, though, it's we're expecting about half a million people. There's a march in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I saw all yeah, the signs. Yeah, it, yeah. Um, and there's marches in almost uh, I think five hundred, five seven hundred, yeah. like a lot of cities. But... Yeah, these are grim times. <laughs> I you know I Trump is heartbreaking. I just the worst person at the worst time. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, can you just talk a little bit more about what you plan on talking about on Saturday for those of us who came home? Well, I think there's an urgent need for science and arts to, to be in better conversation, and that data is the best bridge between how, if an artist sees a flower and describes that with a paintbrush, or if a scientist sees a flower and sees an evolutionary continuum, continuum, they have a lot to talk about. But for some reason, a lot of artists don't know about science, a lot of scientists don't know about art. And I think we both have tools to pull apart this kind of Trump, I don't even know what to call it, the Trump stuff, but just bullshit. But, um, <laughs> um, and I think that uh, people who are prog of progressive intent, one of the tools we haven't used as much as the right wing is emotion. Um, they, you, you can't read with them or logic or show numbers or data facts or data or information. They feel the way they feel because they've been watching on Fox News or something. So no information that me or you, probably anyone in this room, can show them that climate change is bad, Earth on fire is bad. You know they don't they they don't care. So how do you either bypass them, or how do you create a situation where, okay, if you put your hand in fire, it will burn. You like, know, ouch, I'm burning. You know, I mean, they, they just you feel like you're trying to reason with people who just they're they're just mentally locked. So I'm going to talk about this sort of idea of what they call confirmation bias and how there's a psychological and emotional logic at work and with this what they call authoritarian uh, turn. And there's a lot of societies right now, um, the British Brexit, the French elections coming up, the Philippines, China, you name it, there are all these countries that are going uh, to kind of authoritarian. And they're, people, they fear complexity. They fear it's hard for them to process. If it's complicated, they, they want the simplest answer. So you'll get some authoritarian people running around saying, I have the answers, or let's just delete all the data. And you don't have to think about it, just give me the money. And, <laughs> you know, so um, I think it's, it's an urgent necessity that scientists and artists talk more and have better tools to, to, to push back uh, against these kind of people. So that's what I mean. Um, and I'll be DJing too. See you all in Washington. Okay, well, one last question. Oh, um, real quick. This kind of goes off of that. Um, I first came into contact with your work with the, your Rebirth of a Nation film mm -hmm. and the reimagining of cultural artifacts, or it's the ICE project with literal data, um, to further or to get extract further information out of a, a piece of data or a cultural artifact. I just wanted to ask how do you see? Um, you talked about the conversation between artists and scientists. How do you see reimagining data, for example, ice melting? Um, how do you see that playing into how people imagine or conceptualize in their minds about climate change or other sure. topics that you 
makes it work. There's a whole series of essays I think UCLA is doing with the magazine called Vox, you know, Vox.com. There's a great video that says, why are human beings bad at imagining climate change? Um, and it, half of it is that the human time frame is very short. And we only live maybe 100 years, and the planet, you know, millions and millions of years. So, so when you talk about geologic time versus just living for 100 years, most people are just trying to pay their credit card bill and put food on the table and live, you know. So for them, driving to work is because I want to get to work quicker. I mean, I walked here about two miles from down near, uh, I don't know, so two miles down whatever hill. But I could have driven, I could have ridden a bike, but I was like, it's a nice day, I'm gonna walk. But as an artist and someone who's reasonably successful, I, I would prefer to walk, and I don't like, I could have jumped in Uber, so, or whatever. But most people, the idea is convenience, and they wanna be able to have their electricity, their heat, their air conditioning, if it's hot in the summer. Um, and they're not gonna think, oh, if I turn on my air conditioner, am I frying some penguins in Antarctica? They're just you know, gonna put the air conditioner on, or they're gonna jump in their car. Um, and again, fair enough. If that's they don't, they're not thinking about the scale of their action. Um, and that, that, who's to blame them? I mean, most people they just want to wake up and go to work and do whatever. So, but that's the world of art. I mean, we're here to disturb things a little bit and maybe kind of get them out of that reverie, uh, this trance of consumerism, consumer uh, mediated zombies that you know Fox News didn't interest me. I don't know. I mean I, at the moment I'm so irritated. I woke up and saw this idiot when Trump was I was just was like, ah. I thought, yeah, just no people no one could be that stupid to vote this guy. But you're okay, they are that stupid, only shit. Uh, <laughs> um, and the statistics were really eerie. I mean fifty three percent of white women voted for Trump. I mean uh, and there's some numbers like and the, the older whites and then younger whites voted for, you know, there was you know, a couple of people, so the, the mark, the, a lot of women did vote for Clinton because they thought it was their internalized misogyny or the way that they were dealing with, she's not trustworthy, they like, this Trump, they like, we can't even compare, what are you talking about? And I, I, I remember in the ancient 2000s when there was Gore versus Bush, and a lot of lefty progressives were like, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna vote now because Al Gore and Bush are the same thing. And a lot of people you know, were going to vote for Ralph Nader, who at that time was running. Um, it's, you know, these we, elections matter. I mean, they really matter. Um, it's a tragedy. Uh, hopefully, he gets indicted or <laughs> impeached, or some Russians come forward and say, please, we need to save humanity. We gave up Trump all this money, impeach him. But um, <laughs> one can only hope. Um, so, with that said and done, uh, I know we're. Any last quick question? Because um, if you have any other comments, I'm on Twitter at DJ Spooky and Facebook and all that. Um, and if any, if you like any of the projects, they're all on my website. And there's a lot more projects. The Rebirth of Nation one, uh, just for those who aren't aware, it's an early KKK film from 1915 that I remixed. And um, I'm going to be back here for the San Francisco Silent Film Festival in a couple of weeks. And we're going to produce. We're going to present an evening of early. Uh, political silent films from that era. Some of them were problematic, like Birth of a Nation was a KKK recruitment film. <laughs> uh, so I remixed it and then uh, re you know, kind of did a whole thing around the politics of that. Uh, but thank you for that question. I should have, you know, that's one project. There's so many projects I should have. Uh, I mean, that's a classic example of the power of media. I mean, yeah. that, that film, you know, is still, you know, within us. I mean, it, it just, entrenched, you know, it brought, you know, it used media to bring, you know, racism into the 20th, you know, century and, you know, to imprint all of those stereotypes. And yeah, it created a cognitive yeah. Wow. that yeah. people were able to navigate very easily and because it was based on fear yeah. and fear of the other. Yeah, and, yeah. And no, it, yeah. Uh, your remix is brilliant. That's really fabulous. Thank you. Um, so if you have any follow-ups, I'm happy to respond. I do have to go to another thing, so if anyone has any questions or comments, you can just, you know, social media and so on, check, check all that stuff. So thank you guys.